My name is Sandra Sheffre. I'm the president of the Democratic Women's Club of Greater Broward. And I'm here interviewing Narnit Grant. She's a candidate for Broward County School Board Group 9. And we're just going to have a little talk today. We're going to try to do some of this in Creole, but you know, Creole nous pas fort, but not pas fort aujourd'hui. So just to uh, um, inform that community too, because that's one of the communities, at least I know I'm concerned with. So I will have some questions uh, about the Haitian community, given that I'm the children of immigrants. So what we're going to first do first is a allow Narnik Pierre Grant to introduce herself, um, tell us a little bit about her platform, what it is that she wants to do for Broward County School Board children, Broward, the children in Broward County um, as the Group 9 rep uh, for Broward County School Board. All right, here you go, Narnik. Thank you so much, Sandra. I appreciate it, and I appreciate this opportunity. As Sandra said, my name is Narnik Pierre Grant. Um, on your ballot, though, it's going to say Narnik Grant, and there's a strategic move for that because the Pierre will put me down, the Grant will put me up, like on the top. <laughs> alphabetically speaking, right? Alphabetically speaking, that's right. Alphabetically speaking, that's a, alpha, that's a decision for alphabetical purposes, not because... We only has nothing else to do with nothing else. So um, I am running, for, as she said, I'm running for school board seat, which is the at-large seat. Um, and it encompasses all of Broward County, not, not small districts. And we'll get into it about the, the districts in a minute. Um, I have five children, yes. Three of them in a, are in college, two are home. One uh, is in high school, and then the other one is in fifth grade. Hopefully, she will be going into the sixth grade. Um, not hopefully, she will, but uh, hopefully, we'll be physically in school next year. We're week. struggling with this COVID and uh, struggling. learning at home, and we're not sure how much the students learn since we don't know. In March. So, we're hoping that they have enough sixth grade knowledge by the time yes. they're all over. We're, we're, we're hoping to muddle through, and we're hoping to kind of really. Uh, make sure that during the summer we do a lot of reading and a lot of practicing so we'll be ready for sixth grade um so we're excited about that well, that's what uh, we're going to talk about too what life is going to look like after covid so i'm hoping yeah. that it's going to change but i you know i'll tell you what my perspective is on that um i have been married with my from with my husband for 23 years uh, my husband's jamaican by the way when I was looking, there was unavailable. <laughs> <laughs> love, love but, is blind. Love is blind. You love. Love you is blind. Love but um, I have been a PTO president and PTA president for the past nine years. I have. I currently will still do substitute teach for the past three years. I have been on SAC and SAF uh, boards. Um, been very, very active in the school system. Um, I am a devourer of knowledge, which means that I study a lot in the school board, especially the policies, because those really affect our children directly. Um, I uh, made the decision to run um, after the uh, Parkland shooting. I'm thinking a lot of people made decisions around that. Um, that horrible, horrible hit incident. Um, so I made the decision to run. I uh, currently live in Parkland. And one of the things that I uh, noticed or what, things that I've seen is that the, um, the district became very divided. Um, it became a Parkland against the rest of the district. And uh, it didn't sit with me well. And I really wanted to see more of a collaborative, uh, collective coming together with the is entire county. I don't mean to interrupt you, but when you said sure. that some division, was that part partly because some of the students that went to Stoneman Gu Douglas also live in Coral Springs, for instance. So it was only yes. it wasn't only that particular neighborhood. No. That students right. from all um, from different cities right. in that area that goes to that school, and it exactly. seems as though that it was only families that live in Parkland that were affected, exactly. but there were also families Perfect. in Coral Springs. Right. Yeah, parts of some other cities. I'm not. So yeah. Part, well, is, is Coral Springs. Parts of Coral Springs is a feeder band for uh, Douglas. So Douglas takes parts of it um, as the because the district is the way the district is set up. So parts of those um, students do go to Coral uh, to uh, the Parkland School, which was uh, Stoneman Douglas, and um, Coral Springs felt alienated, um, as did the rest of the county. Um, when I was, as I've been doing my campaign, I've been getting feedback from people and. One of the main things is um, that I hear is we're tired of hearing about Parkland. Um, it's unfortunate and it's not, um, and it, you, you know, you, you sympathize with people and you understand uh, both sides. Um, and my goal and um, my, the reason, one of the reasons I'm running and I want to be part of that person that comes in and brings everybody together and have an opportunity to um, 
be a leader as a district, as a, as a county um, for the nation, uh, for a group, a, a county that really strives to uh, make sure that safety and security is a top priority um, and that other schools can model um, what we're trying to do here. And, we've, and they've done a, a quite a bit. They've done quite a bit. And so, you know, just for clarity, sometimes, you know, people may say they're tired of it. And partly it's because there are a lot of schools in Broward County that face some of the similar issues, right? Um, there are right. students that are struggling. There are others, there have been other school shootings, not on the scale of Parkland, but there were some uh, incidents a few years ago where there was a young woman that was shot at school. So there are some schools that continue to deal with violence at their school, and they may not receive the same amount of attention. And again, we're not to take away from the fact of uh, the incident that happened in Parkland was horrific and terrible. And, you know, everyone is very sympathetic. But I believe some, some of the folks or some of the residents of Broward County who may feel a sense of like, you know, when they say tired, they just mean that it's a lot of us. There's a lot of children. There's a lot of families in Broward County that are struggling um, in the school system for very different reasons, and they're not getting um, that attention. And they would also, you know, yes, not them getting attention shouldn't take away from Parkland, but also Parkland getting that much attention shouldn't take away from all the other um, schools in the county um, exactly. being represented. Um, and I think you an example of one of the things that was not uh, put a light on on the rest of the district is that when the you know, incident happened in Parkland, most if not all of the resources from the district was taken out of the rest of the district, the rest of Broward County to accommodate the, you know, the students and the parents and the families in Parkland. Um, and for about a week or two, or maybe sometime, I think even about a month, um, you know, the rest of the district was just operating, uh, you know, at a minimum. Um, there was a lot of counselors that was dispatched over to um, Stoneman Douglas, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, trauma, counselors that are that are trained in trauma um, and the rest of the district couldn't really um, use those uh, those personnel because they were all dispatched and we understood that I believe the district understood that I believe everybody every city in Broward County understood that this is where the the, the you know the hot spot is and this is where most of if not all the resources need to be to help that community um, I just believe over time um, the sentiment is is that you know the district wasn't highlighted to show that, listen, we all suffered. And, and that's how we all suffered because we all had to go without in order to, to provide for um, an area. And another way of suffering too, in the sense that it just happened at that school a lot of times people live in fear that what if it happens at our school, right? Because no one knew, like, because uh, we have a, especially with when media t makes attention to certain things, there's this whole idea of like copycats, you know, yeah. so the other children are going to school not knowing if it's time for their school today because part of the reason why I think everything was so shocking in Parkland was because no one expected it to happen there, right? That's not mm -hmm. something that you expect to happen in that community. So it was, it was shocking. It was terrible. Um, but I think definitely uh, that those resources needed to be dispatched there. But I think we, they also in the county, this is just me talking, not you as a candidate, that the county mm -hmm. needed to acknowledge that there were other students that were living in fear. And there were parents that were afraid to send their children back to school because they didn't know if something like that could have happened. Absolutely. And, and, and those are, and, and, the, and that's the sentiment I've gotten um, when I've been um, campaigning is exactly what you just said. And um, you, I sympathize with that because I, I totally, completely understand uh, something like that does just not, does, it just doesn't affect the city that it happened in and affect the entire county. Because um, we're all in this together. Um, it's one Broward. It's not, you know, parts of Broward. It's one Broward. Um, and, you know, I have been pushing that ever since, um, ever since the tragedy happened. I've always said, you know, Broward strong, Broward strong, because we all suffered. We, I, throughout the county, uh, many parents really expressed how heartbroken they were over that, in, over that uh, shooting. They were very heartbroken. They couldn't imagine. They don't know how the parents are doing. They've been praying for them. Um, so I, you know, while I'm here and I have this opportunity, I want people to know that the entire Broward County um, was very, very um, hurt by what, what happened and was very, very upset about what happened as well. And they um, share the pain of the parents and uh, the community here in Park. Okay. Um, and I just want people to understand that that's what's, what that was, was going on in the county. I don't want it to be where 
they don't realize that that's what it was. It was. We all suffered together. We did. Well, we all suffered. Some more than others, but we all suffered. We all failed. And parents, I'm a, I'm a parent, and just the thought of, like, I sent my child to school and they didn't come home, I just can't even imagine. So we are, we're, we're definitely understanding of, um, you know, the loss that those parents okay. suffered. So right. let's talk about the school board. What do you see is the role of the um, school board? Well, the, the school board members um, have, uh, from my research, have three important functions that they do. They approve the budget, they implement or and or amend policy, and then they supervise the superintendent. They're the uh, superintendent's boss. Um, and through those three tiers, um, they are able to, you know, the, the board members are the school board is like a business and they is like an or you know business organization and they are the business arm of the district so they basically take care of the day-to-day -day, uh, issues budgeting policies making sure that everything is done uh, to the florida statute because they follow most of what the florida statutes provide um, they are in charge of making major decisions um, throughout the throughout the district throughout the school districts and as both of you, both of us know we're parents and whatever affects our children affects us. Um, so it's really, really important that um, people uh, make a conscious effort to um, find out what the school board is doing, what they're voting on, how this affects your kid directly, because um, it's very, very important that we understand that process. So if you're elected, when you're elected, I should say, to the school board, what's your number one priority? Or do you have well, one? What's the number yeah. one priority for yeah. you? My number one priority is to um, bring back uh, a collabor collaborative, collective feel. Um, right now, I know that the uh, school board is working really hard on um, COVID, obviously. Um, but prior to that, they've been working on trying to make school, make sure that the schools are all safe and secure um, and make sure that all their personnel are trained properly um, to uh, continue on with um, you know, some of the uh, new implementations they put in since the tragedy. Um, however, I'd like to bring um, more of a, bring back the community piece um, and try to go out there to uh, get the community more involved. I know that the district does a lot of um, things in the beginning of the school year. And many, there's a lot of workshops during the summer um, to kind of get parents to come in and get more involved. But I believe that there should be there are there's some innovative ways that we can include parents, especially those who are busy, who are working two and three jobs that don't have the time, but there's a way to kind of include them too. Because parents, believe it or not, those who do work and don't have the time and they say that, do appreciate being um, acknowledged and included um, in decision making or and or uh, any aspects of their children's education. So my goal is to come in and bring in new in innovative ways to include include parents more, get more stakeholders to become uh, more involved with the school board. I believe that uh, allowing more people to be involved in many of the big decisions that are made and, and even some policy um, um, amendments would be very, very um, productive for the district. All right. So we know um, some of uh, the people on the school board have their reasons for joining. I know that there's been some concern because we talked earlier about the shooting at Parkland. And I know some of the, uh, what motivated some people to run uh, for school board was that they wanted to get rid of the superintendent, um, Mr. Yeah. Runcie. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, what do you think about the job that he's doing right now for the school board? Well, I mean, um, I think that the superintendent is doing, um, the best job he can under the circumstances. Um, he, you know, I've looked and watched and um, been in meetings with him. He follows um, his uh, directives to a T. Uh, he makes sure everything he's doing with is, it, with it, is within statute. Um, personally, for me, I, I believe that he is doing a, a good job. Now, do you, is there some things that he can kind of tweak a little bit? Yes. Um, is it, from the lack of him not making an effort to uh, communicate or um, not even communicate, but have, a, have an opportunity to talk to people and learn from people? No, because he's gone out and done that. Um, you know, I know that uh, the spotlight is on him since the uh, shooting, and I understand that. Um, you know, everyone will come with, you know, their different reasons as to why he should be uh, no longer the superintendent. Um, however, 
you know, no one's ever prepared for a school shooting. No one's ever prepared for any shooting for that matter. You don't wake up in the morning and, and you know, you step out of your home and then you think that you're not going to come back. So no one's ever prepared. Um, were there things put in place? Um, yes. Did some things fall through the cracks? You know, it depends on who you're talking to. Um, but for me, overall, I think he's done, he's doing, and he's done a good job. Um, you know, again, that, that doesn't mean that he doesn't get any kind of criticism from me because there are some criticisms. I mean, there are some things that I've criticized him about, um, that I think that he should really look into, uh, and take some stock and reevaluate. However, overall, um, you know, going through such a tragedy and being on site, and I think people tend to forget or not even, or not even, um, acknowledge the fact that this man had to be on the property and and walk through those hallways um to see something like that um i i don't i don't know if any of us could ever recover from that but that's that's his job he had no choice right and so um, he, so. he also has another big thing that um issue that he's dealing we're in the middle of a pandemic right now and mm -hmm. that that also crept up on, on us too, right? If that's, if that's the word we want to use. We weren't prepared for that. It came fast. I mean, it was one week we were in school and then, right. you know, it was about to be spring break. And the next thing we heard, you can't go back to school. And we're like, what do you mean we can't go back to right. school? It was, mm -hmm. it was announced one day and then the next day the decision was made that, you know, the children couldn't go back to school, at least in the short term, because they thought, you know, we'd be able to get a handle on it. How do you think well, he's handling um, the, the changes that had to be made in the middle of the pandemic? Um, I think he handled the changes that had to be made pretty well. I mean, to, to dispatch uh, thousands of laptops to children to make sure that those are, are most vulnerable was still able to get food. Um, to uh, get curriculum going, getting the teachers trained to go and, and to move in such a way that we have no idea, uncharted territories, t territory. I think, I think he did a great job. I think that, you know, um, I think the collective, I think the entire district did a great job trying to get this situated um, and getting the kids to, you know, get into some sort of normal um, with under the circumstances. I, I have to tell you, I think, you know, many country, many of the, states um you know struggled with that and i think one of the things that um broward did very well was was able to transition i know the first few days was a little tough and we knew it was going to be um but to really transition and really kind of put forth an effort um an agenda and get this done um in a week um i thought was phenomenal Yes, because yeah, like you said, that we they canceled school one week, and then we were, we were going to be on spring break. But once right. spring break was over, it was on and running. It was on and running. The children and went pick actually, up. No one, no, he never said anything about we we weren't coming back. Like during the, the the time of spring break, he was working that whole time, and we weren't aware until a day or two before spring break ended that we were going to have to end up doing you know at home and then go pick up your your computers and then go do this and then go do that. Um, so to, uh, you know, I have to say kudos to the board too, for working so hard and trying to make sure that these things get done. And I think he did a great job. He came out really, he came out looking good to me. Okay. And so what do you think is going to happen moving forward? Will we be able to go to summer school? Um, I have a daughter that's special need and sometimes she does ESY, which is, you know, summer school for children with special need. Do you think what? ESY is going to happen or, or do you even believe that we might be able to go back and go back to school in the fall? Well, based on the last workshop that they had, which was last week, Tuesday, and I um, was on it watching it live, um, they are putting in, um, putting things in play. That I, uh, apparently, they are working um, simultaneously. They're working to open up school, and then they are working on if it's going to be virtual, um, based on whatever the government tells us. If, you know, uh, we'll see how these next two weeks go, since we're opening up a little bit starting Monday. Um, and then if we have another resurgent or not resurgent, but if we have a uh, reinfection that comes up and the, and the numbers spike, obviously we can't um, send the kids back. So they're working in tandem to get that done. Um, they, are, they talked about providing all their employees PPE. They talked about um, disinfecting. They're talking about how they're gonna get that done. They're talking about how it's going to look. Right now, they're all, it's all in the working stages. And remember, most of the people at the district are working from home. They're not in the buildings per se. Um, so you have to combat with that. You have a lot of meetings going on via Zoom, uh, Teams, 
and all that other stuff. So, you know, though they, even though they're working in and trying to get it done for August, but we still have to remember they have to keep safe too. And they have to work within whatever the parameters are is where they have to work. So, right. So we're doing we are and, and it's, and everything's fluid. So we may be right. back in school and well, we may not be. So with that being said, there are some parents who uh, are afraid to send their children back to school in the fall, even yes. if school reopens, right? Um, yes. what, what, how do you think, the, uh, does the board have anything to do? Um, um, if you were a board member, would you allow parents to utilize that as an option? Because I'm not sure how big or small virtual school is, but if yes. parents decide that they don't want to go back into a brick and mortar building and they right. want to, um, all of a sudden, instead of, you know, whatever the online population is there's a 25 or 30 or 40 percent increase in mm -hmm. students online um do you think the board should uh meet or convene or find a way to tr get everyone trained in order for right. uh, something like that to happen if that is in fact so, um personally i would for me looking uh, you know just looking outside i would i would uh suggest that the board and the superintendent look at making um, some of their teachers be teachers to work from home um, because when they go through I believe Broward virtual school they still get funding for that student at the school at their home school um, so it's not like the funding goes away they still pull from that funding they still they're still part of that group um, and they still get funding for it. So if parents really wanted to do a homeschool rather than sending their kids to school, um, you still have that option. And I believe it's when you go through Broward Virtual School. Um, I think, however, Broward Virtual School is very limited on, um, on courses and stuff like that. That's why they work in conjunction with Florida Virtual School. Um, but you know, for the sanity and the um, comfortability of a parent, um, I, I, I just can't tell you, you need to bring your kid to cool, school. I, I, you know, I want you to be able to be comfortable. Um, and, and uh, you know, if that's where your comfortability lies and that you have to keep your kids home, who am I to tell you not to do that? Um, but, I, but I want people to walk away knowing that you do, if you go through Broward Virtual School, your child is still part of that, their home school, um, and they still, the school still gets funding for them. And that is an option. All right, so the other thing that I wanted to address um, is diversity in Broward County. So mm -hmm. again, I'm a child of immigrant. I'm an immigrant myself. You know, so Broward County is extremely diverse. Very. But, I, I believe over 30% of the population is from some one of the islands in the West Indies, right? And then mm -hmm. we also have a very huge Hispanic population. Um, I've seen the people on the board. I've yep. seen what the school board looks like. Mm -hmm. I don't see a lot of diversity on the board, right? No. Um, do you think that's necessary? Um, uh, would, do you think there's another voice that needs to be heard on the voice? Do you think that uh, children of immigrants uh, have a, di a need outside of what a uh, typical student um, that lives in Broward County? I absolutely, totally, 100% believe that you have to have uh, someone on the board that's representative of the constituents that you serve, of uh, the people that you serve. If you have over, if you have 30% of your population or your group in Broward County that is um, from the Caribbeans, uh, you know, from different countries, you have to have someone that represents them, um, that looks like them, that uh, that they can have as a point of reference. Um, growing up when we were little and coming from Haitian parents, I did not see. Uh, any Haitian person in um, an, uh, an elected official's capacity. I did not see anyone um, who talked like my parents, who was able to relate with my parents um, um, when I was growing up. I didn't see it. And because I didn't see it out of sight, out of mind, you just assume that it never, it doesn't exist. Um, but I, you know, as things have changed and during this, during this time now, it's really, really important that people see um, and children see that there are Haitian Americans on the board, or there are Haitian, uh, you know, or there are Haitian Americans who are running for Congress or who's running for a Senate seat. Um, that they know that coming from their country, their little small island, that they are, they can and will make a difference. Um, we have a high population of Haitian 
uh, people in Broward County, and I've seen time and time again in different schools how difficult it is when you're having a conversation with a Haitian parent um, who is English is not so good, uh, but enough to get them by, but still not enough for a parent to understand um, where their child is, um, education-wise and or socially. Um, you know. People from the Caribbean, people from uh, um, South America, they all have a different way. They have a different culture. And because of that, it's very, very important that the district takes note and um, make sure that that part is uh, highlighted um, and provided in the schools. Now, they do have a um, diversity uh, department in the district that uh, does uh, address um, Haitians. They do address... Uh, the um, Latin American um, community, um, but it's 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 very little. What part of it is very little? Because I think they do some of the notices that they sent home. I, I believe they have it trilingual. It's English, Spanish, and Creole. And Creole. I don't believe everything has it comes in Creole, but I have <laughs> received some letters from school that are in the Creole right. language. Um, and what I mean by very little, I'm not. I, I don't. I think that. Um, Overall, um, in, in the state of Florida, the, you have a lot of um, trilingual things out there apart from the school district. So I think that that's something that um, Florida as a whole really makes an effort to do. Um, but I, when I say by very little, there is a, um, a resource guide, I believe, for the Haitian um, community that's about 70 pages. I might, be, I might be a little generous with the amount of pages, but... Um, Th that and it just gives a history of Haiti and when it started in the middle, you know, some some of their, you know, you know, popular authors and, uh, you know, celebrities, but that's about it. Um, and with the uh, Hispanic ones, there's about there's one for uh, elementary, which is premier, uh, primary and then secondary, which covers the encompasses the middle and high school. Um, and those are about 80 pages each. Um, it's just, it, it just, it's just in, uh, in a nutshell, kind of overall, what that, what, what those cultures are. So um, the only thing that's, um, so just for my clarification, uh, in the diversity section of the Broward County School Board Manual, when they're talking about the Haitian population, they're just giving a history of Haiti and not necessarily how children are performing um, in the schools in Broward County or how they, they're, how they're they represented. Do they do touch on their performances, um, but it's, it doesn't go into depth. It, and, and it's something also, there are, um, there's items on there that it's, it's, it's supposed to be implemented in schools so children can learn about that, especially if, you have a, you, if you're in an area that is a high population of Haitian um, community, uh, they are supposed to be part of the curriculum. They're supposed to put that part of the curriculum. Now, is that happening? Um, I've been to several schools that are, uh, with heavy Haitian concentration, and no, they're not doing that. Um, and again, it goes to the, you know, it goes by if the teacher has an opportunity to get to that and provide it to the student. Um, I think teachers are so bogged down with testing and bogged down with um, uh, different milestones they have to reach at a certain time. They won't, there's no way for them to have time to kind of promote that or uh, bring it in until maybe the month of May when it's Haitian, Amer you know, Haitian Heritage Month. Um, but I truly believe that that's something that needs to be part of the curriculum. Um, you know, this, we are a nation of immigrants. This, this is, this is not, um, a country that was, you know, there was a certain amount of people here and then that made this country. We're a, a nation of immigrants. So th there's not one person who's here that's not from another country. Um, and so that is a rich history. And so we should make sure that in the school systems um, that that is something that is prominent, um, not on a month to celebrate. It should be something that's prominent all the time. In the curriculum. Um, right. Yep, in the so curriculum. we're talking about immigrants. Uh, one of the things, so there's a couple of things and this fits in. So Broward County is um, public school system is there to educate all children, not okay. just the American children, all children. Mm -hmm. Often are, are, but um, some of the children um, that are in that live in the county have um, immigration issues, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think the school board uh, or the school system have any responsibility to either educate 
um, these students um, on maybe some resource that's available to them? Or, uh, you know, wh what do you think about that? Because we have a lot of Im um, students that are immigrants. Some of them are um, uh, without status or some of them have parents that are without status and they live in fear because we yep. know like um, having coming to school with different levels of anxiety can impact uh, a student's education. Right. Do you think um, because we have such a huge um, undocumented population in Broward County, do you think the school has any responsibility to see if they can provide some sort of resource or at least advise uh, the students um, in the school system about that? So they do um, under the equity diversity uh, department. They have a whole manual on DACA um, in the, uh, and I'm not sure if that has been updated since the uh, recent changes with DACA, um, but they do. Um, they provide legal, medical services, resources, um, and they uh, make it clear if you go on the website and you read it, they make it clear that they are going to, no matter what else no matter what else is around them, they will be, they do. And they said that they will take care of children who are undocumented. So how do, how do, how is that program advertised? How would a student in, in a classroom know this? How would they know this? Um, it's, it's not advertised. It's on their website. Um, that's the only advertising I, I, I can see through. I, I don't, I mean, if, I believe that if an administrator or a teacher has an inkling that this kid may be, or the, this child may be, um, someone who's undocumented or whatever, I believe that they do um, make it a point to help that child. But I don't know if the child, if the child doesn't say anything, um, will they be able to get the help that they need? Right, um, because you can't really ask, right? Because that's not that's not the point of the right. classroom. But um, mm -hmm. these, but those resources are there. It's just the parents or right. we need to try to. And it's not like it's given out um, and say, hey, uh, I mean, I would like it to be part of the first day packet where you, you know, that, you know, what I think most of the things that are part of the first day packet, I think Medicaid sign up is on there. Um, I, you know, your, you know, the, not free and reduced lunch, I believe, right? The uh, insurance, insurance, yeah, you know, yeah. um, and, you know, Birds just, you, you know, the student code co conduct that has mm -hmm. to be on there, for, you know, for you to get for you to sign. But that would be, um, uh, that should be an added, especially with, especially with Florida that has a very high concentration of immigrants. Um, it would be um, beneficial if it's something that's put in the first day packet or something that's sent periodically throughout the school year, maybe once or twice throughout the school year, send that home um, with the rest of the stuff that they send, they send home with the kids. Um, it, it would be a beneficial if they would start doing that, but it is on their website. It is a service that they provide. And then it is something that they do. They do not, um, uh, they automatically help uh, children who are undocumented. There's no, there's nothing that precludes them from doing that. Okay. So, and they promote and, it. And so on our undocumented, there's a couple, you know, just business thing that we have to deal with. One of the, um, we're at 2020, it's time for the census. Oh, um, yes. That's something that we need to do because it's important that everybody counts and tell us why it's important that all the children and the people of Broward County is counted for the census and how does that impact um, the school board? Right. Everybody counts because those are monies that go straight into the education system. Um, even when you're not documented, undocumented, you've been here for two days, you ain't there for two days, it doesn't matter. I think, I think uh, Sandra, isn't it, as long as you've been at the house since April 1st, First. Yes. you yes. are counted. Um, yes. We need those numbers, especially since um, there was a recent poll in rural areas um, it's been passed in the federal at the federal level where at one point we could have used all the kids who were um the numbers of children that were on free and reduced lunch was one of the numbers that they used to use for the for the census and and that way they can get there get an accurate number because many people don't fill out the census they've done away with that so it's more impaired it's imperative more so than ever that you fill out your census um and send it back it's literally five five to seven minutes um, and whether you are documented or undocumented, it does not, um, you will not get reported or you will not get in trouble. That information um, is not shared. It's not shared right. with any other agencies. It's not shared with ICE. And the website is census2020.gov. Census, census2020.gov. It's very, very important that we get everyone counted because every little bit of person helps to, um, provide money towards our budget. Education is on the bottom of the totem pole. 
they are the last to get any kind of funding and the little bit of funding that they do have, we have to split it. So whatever Florida gets has to be split by uh, the rest of the 64 counties I think we have in Florida. And so when you think about it, you have, and all counties are not the same. Um, your three biggest counties are Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach. Um, those three, three biggest counties obviously take a little bit more of the pie. However, that doesn't um, mean that, you know, Osceola, or Osceola, however you pronounce Osceola. it, yeah, doesn't deserve to get a certain amount of money. I mean, all counties are different, but we get it. But every person counts. And so, um, you know, we're facing a budget cut um, coming the next school year. Um, obviously, we knew that that was coming. Um, and, you know, with, with something like that, that's, it's more important for everybody to fill out their census. Yes. Yes, and I was trying to look up the phone number while we were talking because you can right. also call in, right? You um, sure can call in. Um, I'm not sure if you have to be, uh, if you have to. Um, and I know you can, I think you can get the census also in, very di in several different languages. So if yeah. you speak a different language, um, you can um, have someone, uh, you can get your form in that language. You can call in, the phone number for the census is 855-562-2020. Um, that's 855-562-2020. I hope that's not a job number. I hope it's not a job number. That might be a job number. I think that's a job number. So we'll, we'll, we'll um, try to get that information. That might be so, so if you're looking for a job, then you can call that 855-562-2020. Um, I was trying to find a phone number to put that up, but that seems to be a job number. Right. Um, going back to um, making sure that Okay, I found a number. So if you Good. want to do a um, census, if you want to do your census and call in, it's 844-330-2020. That's the phone number if you want to call in to complete your census form, 844-330-2020. And if you want a job with the census, it's the 855-562-2020. I was told that it's $18 an hour. So how much does it pay? $18 an hour. Hey, that's not bad. That's not bad <laughs> to make sure people fill out their, um, fill out their census. And the other thing, the other, the other thing that we definitely got to address, um, and I didn't mean to cut you off, oh. is um, we want everyone to vote for you for um, Sprout oh. School Board yeah. Group so 9. Me, me that. Yep. So listen, um, in Broward County, there is nine seats on the board. Um, three of them are up for election, right? Um, however, with me, Anybody can vote for me um, because I'm an at-large seat. But you have District 3, I believe, and District 5 that are up for re-election. Um, only those people who live in those districts can, can, um, can vote for them. And I think those districts, uh, District 3 has like Fort Lauderdale, Oakland Park, Dana Beach, and then District 5 is like Lauderdale Hill, Lauderdale Lake, Sunrise, those areas. It's in the um, same area. People, yeah, same area. They kind of share some of their, they share like borderline. Yes, yes, yes. But all of Broward can vote for me. And this is like a big push. So my email, email, my website is www.narniquepierre-grant2020.com. Um, and please go on there and donate. You can donate 2020 for 2020. Yeah, Facebook and um, IG. Social IG media. is Narnie. Social media. That's right. Our IG is Narnie Grant, um, Broward County Public Schools, the acronym, um, 2020. And then my Facebook page is Narnie Grant uh, Broward County Public Schools, the acronym, um, seat nine, uh, and you can't miss that. Um, but please go on my website, sign up to, to volunteer, sign up to give me that 2020. 2020, you know, 20, 20 cents, y'all. Dig deep. 20 dollars and 20 cents. That's 20 it. cents. Everybody got that. 20 everybody 20 can do that. 20, just a little bit. I, everybody, I'm just saying, not everybody can do it. You can pay a little 2020. I would appreciate a little 2020. Right, Ross has um, been closed for like two months. We ain't been shopping, so 2020. Right? Yes, you <laughs> yes. take some of that shoe money. Yes, <laughs> yes, we couldn't buy it for like two months. Provide it's a thing. My 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 uh my platform is when you go on my website, you'll see accountability and transparency. I'm all about being accountable and transparent. I you I'm one of those people, and I mean I mean maybe I shouldn't say it, but I'm one of those people when I do something wrong or if I make a mistake and I drop the ball, I'll be the first one to say it's my bad. I'm sorry. How can like, I do it better? And we learn from our mistakes, right? We learn from, learn from our from mistakes. You really learn from your mistakes. Right. Absolutely. And then I'm, I'm, I'm going to make sure that 
I'm transparent. I can't talk for anybody else on the board, but for me, I'm going to be as transparent as possible. Um, people need to understand that what happens in the district is public record. You can get a public re record request and pull out anything if you want. So I have no choice but to be transparent. <laughs> that's, you know, that's just what it is. Um, mental health is a top thing for me. Um, I uh, believe that that should be incorporated in the curriculum moving forward. Um, not only, you know, not only should we be doing uh, red code drills, but we should also be doing mental health drills um, to help the kids kind of combat the two. We need to have them have a little a bit of balance. Um, I'm all about policy and stigma for mental health because it seems like it's some stigma associated, but it's nothing wrong with needing help. I mean, particularly now, since we've been stuck in our houses for two months, you know, you got to find a way to get some new tools yes. in the toolbox to you keep you safe, to. right? So there's, there's no shame. And like if you're experiencing some level of anxiety or maybe even depression, and I'm sure some people are going to have some issues when it's time to go back outside. Like, you know, exactly. there's going to be some anxiety associated with that, right? And the fact that we were in the house for two months, at least two months, if not more. If, by the time school starts, it might be four or five months for some people. You know, there might be children, some, you know, want to be bringing them back. And so they're accustomed to coming to school on Monday morning and their teacher asking them how their weekend was and they get to talk about it and that's part of the mental health part a uh, cluster too that, that that they train the teachers to do that to kind of see where they are um, so they're not getting that so I would love it for it to be something that is incorporated in the curriculum make it part of the curriculum um, that children are in a in a space where they can feel comfortable to say and and be in a feel feel safe to say what they need to say um, yeah. without being um, thinking that something may not or may not happen for them. So it's, I think that it, we need to incorporate, co incorporate that. Um, I'm all, also, all about policy implementation. Um, there's a few policies that you all need to look at. Oh, tell, no. us, tell us what we got to look at. You know, what, what do we need to be on alert for? What do you, you come look to at that, that policy that school board? <laughs> uh, listen, um, you need to look at that 2130 policy. What is that, that about? Policy, that is the zero tolerance policy. Is that for bad behavior in school? Actually, no, the 2130 is the threat assessment policy, but it's, it's, it is called the zero tolerance policy. You, that was implemented in June of uh, 2019. Um, and that was uh, a direct result out of the, the um, MSD shooting. Um, please read it. Uh, read it in, and if you don't understand the jargon, you need to find you somebody who can explain it to you. Um, it's pretty, it's it's pretty self, it's pretty easy to understand. So that's um, basically if a student makes a threat, uh, even if it's jokingly or not, the school has zero tolerance and they do a threat assessment. And if correct. they believe that they're going to do something, they can put them out of school, suspend them, uh, send them to one of the alternative schools or something like that. That's how serious it's that all based, is. It's all based on whoever is observing it. And based who, on and their how they interpret that behavior. And how they interpret it. Um, and it's, to me, it's, it's too general. Um, just my personal opinion, too general. Um, and so I'm putting my whole, uh, my whole trust into someone who interprets something and they may, may or may not be interpreting it the right way. Again, that's, and it all goes back to culture too, because sometimes there's some cultural things that goes on, that goes on and it's not a threat and it's not um, a, a threat of violence or anything like that. It's just part of the culture. So um, that's, that's a uh, policy you need to watch. You need to also watch policy 5006. 5006 is the discipline policy. Get on it. Y'all need to get it's on what, that. What, 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 are they going to go back to paddling? Because when I went to school. No, nope, no, they don't go back to paddling. paddling. Are they going to do that? What, what is uh, that policy? No, but I think that these, these changes and amendments that were made obviously were made because of the shooting and I and 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 in some respects I understand um, but in others it could be very detrimental to some children so tell um, us what that one says so you know because some parents you know, just, just if we could sum it up in about two sentences if that's at all possible or what in that policy do you think parents need to be aware of well I the discipline one of the major people that need to worry about is 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 people like you Sandra who have children who are ESC um, while you still have the disability, the disability act, um, some children, um, even if they do have a 504, um, and, 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 it, and, and that's the other thing that I have a, that I have an issue with, and maybe I'm reading it incorrectly, but that 2130 policy, um, in my, in my opinion, that the policies need to be, they need to be congruent they need to be they need to go together right 
So one policy can't say if they show a very bad behavior, it's perceived as a threat and we need to take that child out and put them somewhere. But, it, but in the same instance, it doesn't say anything about uh, a child who has um, a learning disability. Um, so whatever is in one should be in the other. That way everything is on the same page. We're all on the same level. Um, some of the disciplines that, that, um, that, is, uh, that, that has been amended on this 500, was it 5006, 5003 um, policy, um, it's almost like, it's almost like these policies were amended and change it, changed to, um, like be be something uh something be have something done harshly and not even think about the promise program if that makes any sense it's almost like they it's almost like they made it to a point where uh anything is deemed a threat your child doesn't even have a chance because most of these most of these uh threats or uh most of these infractions or whatever are the 50 percent of them go straight to um, being either sent to a center or being expelled or being suspended. Um, it, you know, although you have, you may have due process, but depending on who well, who is, who has observed and who is talking about it and who writ, wrote it up, it all depends. Um, you know, I understand the, I understand the boards need to be uh, vigilant. I understand that. However, we're dealing with children. And um, as a parent, and most, most of the board members are parents, children need repetition, and they need consistency, and they need redirection. But if you're putting in a policy that doesn't um, allow for that, what is the results of that? So you mentioned a promise program. Uh, what is that program? Well, the promise program is for, um, it, it, was, it was created back in 2016 uh, with uh, the superintendent, um, some judges um, to stop the prison, the school to prison pipeline. Um, there were too many students. I think back in 2000, I wanna say 14 or 15, uh, we had about 1,062 kids incarcerated uh, from uh, some infractions in school that, uh, many times was not necessarily um, or wasn't was deemed a misdemeanor but not necessarily really reached the level of, of misdemeanor behavior um, so the superintendent and um, several people the, the president of the NAACP um, the uh, public defender's office the state attorney's office they all sat down went through it made the decision to come up with a, a way to, to stop the school to prison pipeline uh, worked uh, by the time 2016 rolled around, we were down by 90%. Um, and this pro and this program that they uh, implemented is not just a program to send a child to the center as a form of punishment, but it was a program that really um, went to the core of what and why is this child doing this? How can we help them to redirect them into a better space um, and get them to um, a space where they can um, maintain their behavior and be be a productive member of society it wasn't um, only punishment it was also um providing services and resources that might have made you know the, 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 going child, to the child's parents the child's family where they lived it wasn't just the the child they involved everyone and because you it, the, it so you can't just isolate the child and isolate the problem and deal with you want to find out what the, the extenuating circumstances around the whole issue uh, to, that causes the child to be that way so they uh, attack it all um, and it's a great program um, uh, if you have an opportunity please reach out to dr brown um, he is the um, principal at what's the name of the school I forgot the name of the school I hate that one that happens to me um, but if you look him up in, in, the, in, the, in the district, you'll find him. His name is Dr. Brown. He is the head of uh, the, the, uh, the school where the Promise program is. Um, I had an opportunity to speak to him on two occasions, and I wanted him to break it down to me and tell me, you know, um, this was about a year after the, 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 uh, 
the shooting and I wanted to know why was uh, people so against this program? What, what, what is it that you're doing that, that, that people don't understand why it's not good or, you know, and he broke it down to me. He explained to me, he said, we don't just, we don't just deal with the child. We deal with the child. We deal with the parents. We deal with their environment. We find out where they are. We find out where they hang out at. We find out who their friends are. We try to come in and we, we, we do a whole host of things with the student to make sure that once they're out of the program, they don't come back. Um, and if you have an opportunity, his door is always open. He is very gracious. He will allow you to have a conversation with him. He would give you a tour at the school so you can see for yourself, um, you know, how beneficial this program is. Um, you know, you hear stories about, you know, the shooter wasn't it, wasn't in it, not, they don't know. Um, again, you're well within your rights to ask for a public record request and you can see um, depending, I, I know with certain information, with his information, some of it is very private, but for the general gist of it, you can have an opportunity to see um, if, and if that was what it was, um, you know. Right. Thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to Thank talk you. to us um, about, you know, what it, what's your vision for the Brown County School Board, um, how you think you can better serve that community. One of the reasons why I um, like to, um, um, highlight um, what I consider our down ballot candidates because we are in an election year. We're in a presidential election year. And some people just go in and they only vote for the president and they don't think the down ballot candidates matter. They absolutely matter because you would be one of the people that are making decisions that will directly affect residents of Broward County. So it's very important that we vote for all of the candidates in our county and make sure that we vote for candidates that are going to represent um, the needs of the constituents in the residents of Broward County. So thank you very much. Narnit, you. It's going to be Narnit Grant on the ballot. Right. Broward County School Board Group yes. 9. It's an at-large seat, so everybody in Broward County, East, West, South Broward, North Broward, over here by US 27, everybody can vote um, vote for Narnit Grant for School Board Group 9. And it was a pleasure um, talking to you. And, Absolutely you know, pleasure. go ahead. We'll continue to um, push on and press on. And early um, the primaries are August, August 18th. 18th. Yes. Don't 20th. wait until November to vote for me. You have to vote, you have to August. vote in August for the primary. Right. And you have to vote in August. Right. August 20th. August 18, 2020 is a primary date. And she got to get past the primaries to be on the ballot in November. So we have to do that. And when we're talking and, and, and talking about that, the other thing that's extremely important that we do is that we request a mail-in ballot, right? We need, we're encouraging people to request a mail-in ballot because we do not know what's going to happen with this pandemic. If it's going to extend through the summer or even if it clears up during the summer, if we're going to run into the same situation come fall. Okay. Because there are some reports that are saying that it's going to come back again with a vengeance in the fall. So we want to be ready. We don't want to expose ourselves to, to vote. If you can vote by mail, request your ballot, uh, vote by mail, send it in early, and you can track your ballots to make sure that your vote is counted. Right. right. That's one of the supervisor of elections website. Uh, yeah. The wonderful thing about the supervisor of the election website is that as soon as you go on there and you click, you, know, you just type it in your URLR, um, it pops up. The request to get your ballot mailed to you pops up automatically. Go in there, put in your information, and uh, they still send you your ballot. And it's um, BrowardSOE.org, right? That's the website, BrowardSOE.org is the website. Yep. Request a mail-in ballot. All right. Thank you, Nani Grant. Thank you. It was really good Look, talking was, to you. It was, very, it was a great opportunity. I appreciate yes, it. Yes. And again, don't forget Narni Pierre Grant. Uh, Narni Grant on the ballot. Narni Pierre dash Grant, G-R-A-N-T 2020 at, uh, dot com. And, and she wants twenty dollars and twenty cent on a monthly basis if you can, right? You could you could give up to a thousand dollars, but you know, we'll start tomorrow. 2020. 2020. Thank right. you so much. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you. Have a good All one. Right. Bye bye. All right, you too. Bye bye.